You're better off paying a little bit more once than paying for something twice, at least I've found. I wrote in the forums a couple of weeks ago to an investor asking for advice that you do get what you pay for, but that doesn't mean more expensive is always better. It does mean that cheaper is never better. There's, <laughs> cheaper is never better. There's, those two are not compatible. Today, I've got something special lined up for you. We're going to be diving deep into the world of investment strategies, and more specifically, my personal favorite strategy, the ever relevant buy and hold strategy. I know a lot of people have been asking me personally and just around bigger pockets have been asking about the best approaches to 2024. And that's why we're bringing on an expert on this matter. Joining us today is Chris Clothier. He is a seasoned investor. He's got a wealth of knowledge in the field. He's been navigating the market for many years and is here to share his thoughts on why buy and hold specifically, this particular strategy continues to really be one of the most reliable powerhouses in the current financial landscape. So we're gonna be discussing its nuances, potential pitfalls, how it aligns, risks, rewards, all those things, and how it fits into your 2024 strategy. So Chris, thanks so much for joining us. No, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Dave. All right, let me start with one very broad question for you. <laughs> Tell me about how you see the big, the biggest and let's say most important real estate market trends of 2024. I think the biggest trends for 2024 is that if you are um, looking to get into the real estate market, a first time investor, probably more than than uh, Any time in recent history, you need to be smart and patient. Take your time. There's a lot of, there's a lot happening in the real estate market right now that some of it's undercurrent. You know that you really need to understand before you invest. By and large, if you do your homework and you are patient, absolutely, 2024 uh, is as good a time as any to get started building. Uh, a long-term buy and hold portfolio. Let's talk about the elephant in the room and, and just get, talk about some of the challenges right now, because interest rates are, of course, a lot higher than they were a couple of years ago. The economy, you know, you hear different news every single day. It's often contradictory, and this leads to a lot of confusion. You still, it sounds like, think that buy and hold investing makes sense even in this economic climate. Is that right? There are individual markets around the country. There is no one U.S. housing market. While there are certainly markets, in when I say markets, I mean cities, there's certainly cities around the country that that I'm not going to buy in this year, that I'm not excited to invest in. Uh, there are also cities that I'm very excited to invest in. I generally believe that there are strategies that work in almost any market, but not every strategy works in every market. And so I think that's really important for people to know. So let's just, you, you mentioned something about time and taking your time. And that is definitely one of the more important things to consider when a buy and hold, as the name suggests, you know, it does take time. So why do you like buy and hold investing? And like, what, can you just talk a little bit about how time factors into that? Sure, absolutely. So I bought my first property in 1997 and got serious about investing in 2003. My initial reasoning for getting in was I wanted to buy, and it was just a you know off the top of the head number, but I wanted to own 50 properties free and clear. And I knew that the best way to do that was if I could purchase the properties and then hold them over time. You know, I, I planned to have good quality residents in the homes. I thought I was going to have you know perfect property management, all these you know rainbows and cupcakes. But the the reality is that I knew that over time. A resident would pay these notes down for me and I could let, again, there's the word time, do its magic. That if I borrowed at today's rates and borrowed money at today's values, that in the future, these properties would be worth more and someone would have paid my note off for me. Sounds simple, but you know, over a 15-year period, there's nothing sexy to it. It's just essentially over that time, I choose to pay my homes off in 15 years, not 30 or less. And so... Over time, someone else is going to pay every dollar I'm going to give back to the bank. And the bank gave me this money to buy this property. So, and the the beauty of it is, is that for round numbers, if I put 30% down and the bank gives me 70, I get to make the appreciation on their 70. Is it? So someone else is going to pay that 70 back for me, but I get to benefit from all the, the appreciation of it. So 
you know, it's this is one strategy and I employ it. I've got a good job that I do outside of real estate, so I don't swing hammers and do any of that kind of stuff. I just simply own and let time pay that thing off for me. You know, if I've done my homework, then the, the values go up. That's a perfect way of putting it because one, like you said, having someone else pay your mortgage down for you, uh, some people call it loan pay down or amortization, but it's kind of this silent thing that you, where you own properties and it's just contributing to your returns. It can add three, four, 5% to your return, depending on, you know, what kind of loan product you have. And that's on top of any potential appreciation. That's on top of any cash flow that you can be uh, generating at the same time. The thing that personally I like about buy and hold so much, particularly right now, is because you're intending to hold it for 15 years or longer, what happens in the market this year or next year, it doesn't really matter that much, right? Like I know people always get really caught up in like looking at what direction that prices are going, but if you what really matters is what the price is going to be 15 years from now or 20 years from now when you go to sell it and how much cash flow it generates for you and those things still work regardless of what happens in the next year or two and you know the housing prices just go up over time even if they have short term fluctuations and so that's why for me I've done a lot of different strategies in in my career but the last year or two have just almost reverted completely back to just buy and hold long term investing because it works it just you said it's simple. There's nothing wrong with simple. If people also are into it, you know, I'm sold. But if hopefully other people are interested in this strategy as well, can you give us a couple of tips about picking the right properties for the long-term buy and hold strategy? I've got a, a simple rule that I tell people all the time, and, and you can find this information simply. Uh, you look for what's the median price point of homes in the area you're buying. You can start with MSA and then down into the city itself, but you really also need to pay attention to the the particular area you're buying. And if the area you're buying, the median value of the home is higher than the median value for the city, you're in a pretty good area. You're in a you're in the right location. I only buy homes that are you know five, maybe ten percent max below median price point, and I'll buy them up to. 30% above median price point for a market. And the reason why is that all the data points to, especially on the renter side, that uh, in my markets anyway, I'm a, a vast majority, 70% or more of the renters are renting in that price point home. The next bigger portion are renting below. I want to be in areas where I have a high probability of demand, so high upside of going up in value. So I stick to the median price point of a home in an area is where I want to be. I don't want to be too far below. I don't want to be too too far above, but I'll take some risks there if I think there's upside. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I, I like markets where the the median income, so they're highly affordable. So the median income versus median value is roughly two to 2.5, meaning that it's not more than two and a half times greater value versus income. And what that points to is highly affordable market where the what the people are making there, whether they're renting or owning, at some point, they're going to be able to afford to buy that home. That's what I look for. It's simple. It's not, again, it's not complicated. It's just, what's the median price? Is the market affordable? And I try and stay in that range. What about financing, Chris? How do you recommend people pursue financing for buy and hold? Well, there's a couple of things. It hasn't changed. So you want to get pre-approved on the front end. Um, you obviously want to protect your credit for, you know, if you're an investor, you want to you have the best credit possible. I suggest you be as professional as possible. If you're working with local banks, you might even consider putting together a bank book, which is just a simple three ring binder that gives the bank all the information they're going to want to know about you. And you're going to put it on their desk. They get hundreds of applications to, to do loans every single week. If they've got a three ring binder from you that's professionally put together that lists out what you want to do as a professional relationship with their bank, you're going to move to the top of the list. So I tell investors, be prepared, be professional, whether it's local or you're working with somebody, you know, through an online relationship and over the phone to to get pre-qualified. The second thing is that, you know, that that's all the, nothing's really changed from that. The tips I would give people is be careful. There's uh today, you know, you can buy homes with 2.99% financing for 12 months. <laughs> yeah, for 12 and that's the yeah, I was like waiting for, I was like, yeah, yeah. you need to be aware okay. of that because then it becomes seven and a half and it's, those are two very yeah. different numbers yes. or, or whatever. If there is a discounted rate, then make sure it's for 
30 years, the life of the loan, that kind of thing. So there's, there's lots of stuff today where you can get the most favorable terms possible, but you want to make sure there's no asterisks involved and you pay for it later. I, I think people really just need to remember, like you get what you pay for. And if something seems like it's too good to be true, you might want to just take a step back and maybe ask a friend, ask an experienced investor. Like if everyone around you is getting a 7% mortgage rate and you're getting a four, just understand why that is, because it's not that you found a deal no one else can find. I liken it to, I, I wrote in the forums um, a couple of weeks ago to an investor asking for advice that more expensive doesn't always mean better. And, and it doesn't. You do get what you pay for, but that doesn't mean more expensive is always better. It does mean that cheaper is never better. <laughs> Those two things don't go together. All right, Chris. Well, let's let's go to the last thing here I wanted to ask you about, which is exit strategies. Because if you're buying something, buy and hold, it can be tempting to hold on to it forever. So how do you think about when to sell a property and how do you realize or sort of pull out, get some of the value that you're creating in these properties over the a long period of time? I tell people to never, like, time in the market is way more valuable than timing the market. And that's generally something that we talk about on the front end, like when you're buying. But it also relates to on the back end when you're selling. I think selling is a personal, it's a personal decision. It's a, it's a personal feeling. I have sold houses in the past because I had an opportunity. And so those houses, the equity that was in them, the opportunity cost of, of not selling was greater than the opportunity of holding. So I just, I was like, I need to sell so that I can turn this into another opportunity with greater upside. I totally agree. I uh, I, I wrote a book recently. It just came out the other day and I, I there's a chapter in it where I talk about how you sort of have to adopt this mindset of just what I call like resource optimization. And you just kind of have to be thinking about like, I have all this money in this property. That might be great. You might be happy with that. But are you are there deals just falling into your lap left, right, and center? Cause like then maybe you should sell it and then go get these better deals. If you're in a market where you would lower your return by selling and getting something else, you should probably hold on to it. And you sort of have to just adapt this way of thinking where you don't want to be thinking about it every day. That's like that opposite of long of long-term thinking. But like, you know, for me, I I like to look at my properties once a quarter. And I'm just like, okay, this one's doing well. This one, it's a pain in my butt. I'm going to sell it. You know, like, and you just kind of like think about it in that way and make sure that you're always, as Chris said, just thinking about the opportunity cost of having your money tied up and can it be used better somewhere else? If not, hold on. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much for sharing your insights. This is uh, yeah. hugely helpful for me and for the rest of our audience. People want to learn more about you. Where should they find you? Well, I'm on Bigger Pockets. Number one, uh, I'm all over the the site. But you can so you can find me on Bigger Pockets at Chris Clothier. My my family's company is called REI Nation, uh, and we work with long term buy and hold investors through the turnkey model. So at any time, you can find me at REI Nation and connect with me on Bigger Pockets. Find me at REI Nation. Let me know anything I can do to help assist you and guide you in the right direction. Happy to do it. All right, great. Well, as a longtime Bigger Pockets employee, I must thank you for being such a good and uh, long-term member of the Bigger Pockets community. We certainly help uh, appreciate it. Yeah, man. If you all don't know me, my name is Dave Meyer. And if you found this video helpful, please like this video and subscribe to the Bigger Pockets YouTube channel for more videos just like this. Or you can also go to biggerpockets.com to check out the amazing tools, the forums Chris was talking about. We have tons of different options for new investors who want to learn this strategy or really any other real estate investing strategy. And always, if you have any questions about this for either Chris or I, make sure to drop them in the comments below. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day.